Well, welcome to part two of our Blade Runner Cybertruck video for the reveal. And in this video, we're going to go ahead and talk about a few of the comments from the previous video. Fantastic comments. Basically, the comments from the previous video broke down into two different sections. Those that dealt with the specifications of it as far as its size, its capabilities, and that kind of a thing. And then uh, the comments that addressed what the thing might look like. And there were uh, two folks that really nailed what the thing was going to uh, look like. Uh, and then uh, one honorable mention uh, comment that actually I think encompassed the whole flavor of the uh, hype leading up to the reveal and the reveal itself. Uh, and we'll, we'll go over all of those. But I just want to uh, address briefly those comments that dealt with the engineering. They were far more correct than they were wrong. Uh, everything from you know, the power socket delivery, the size of the truck, uh, pulling capacity versus towing capacity. There were a lot of fantastic comments for those that are seeing just this video first. Then I'd recommend going back and, and checking out that other video just for the comments. They were, they were wonderful. So uh, as we are wont to do here, what we will do is we'll address the elephant in the room and talk about the car's looks. Uh, first and so my promise to myself and ultimately to you guys was that when I was watching the reveal I wanted to clear my mind of anything that would uh, uh, kind of influence my decision I just wanted to get that that first visceral reaction to what it was that the thing looked like and to do that I actually basically ignored all of the hype blah 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 blah, blah everything that was being said to to hype up the, the, the reveal before they actually showed the car. I figured I can always watch that later. I'll then see what, you know, what I might have missed. But the important thing for me was, what's my gut feeling as soon as I see the car? So that's what I did. Well, when they rolled the car out, my absolute first impression of that when it rolled out was, ah, that's how they're able to keep it under $40,000 uh, or $50,000 for one that's probably decently, uh, decently kitted out. By that, what I mean is back to what I said previously about the design. That car was not designed. That car was engineered. So to understand what I mean about that, let's uh, take a look real quick. This is a uh, engineering study model. Now, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, when you were doing an engineering study model for something like a car or something else that had a very complex structure, you'd build a framework and then you would stress that framework and you would see where the forces built up and, and that type of thing. It was sister calculations. Calculations were great, but back then they didn't have the computer power that we do today. Well, today we don't do that anymore. We do all our wireframes and stress modeling on computer. Well, as was admitted by Musk on, in, in the reveal, they did an extensive computer modeling for this chassis where they made it into an exoskeleton. And so instead of going with a body on frame design, they went to try and see how strong they can make this exterior package. It's a great, great, that was a great way to design an electric vehicle. It's much more difficult to try and do that kind of a thing if you've got to try and figure out where you're going to route your exhaust system and put your engine and how to deal with the heat and all of that. And so it was fantastic that we're actually seeing this ability to leverage the fact that it's an all-electric vehicle to create such a thing. Now here's what I have to stress about engineered versus designed. When they made that wireframe model, once they got done with the wireframe model, they skinned it. That's it. We're done. We're not going to do any more design work. They did not hire a cubist for $200,000 to decide what the shape of the future is going to be. Uh, and Elon may have looked at things like the Lotus Esprit or the uh, DeLorean to get an idea for what he might be able to get away with as far as what this thing looks like. That may ultimately be true. And then he also came out uh, recently with a tweet and said, oh, well, you know, we wouldn't be able to stamp cold rolled stainless steel. Well, that's, that's true, but that isn't the real reason why they 
did what they did. The reason they did what they did was money. They were able to stop the design process dead in its tracks right after they made that engineering study model. Oh, that's great. Let's make that then. Well, obviously that comes with some downsides. And one of those downsides was the shock that most people had when this thing was rolled out. What the hell? And that's because most people are used to having trucks designed. And GM, Ford, uh, they, they all make these uh, um, huge investments in what the thing is going to look like. And I, from a, a dollars and cents standpoint, it does start to get a little idiotic to realize that you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars, possibly as much as a billion dollars, trying to figure out what the damn thing's going to look like. Especially when all people want is a Tesla. That's the main takeaway here, and we'll close our video with what I just said. But let's step back just a second, take a look at the design of the thing. So here's the uh, design. Now take a look at this and you'll notice there isn't a rounded surface anywhere on this car. It's completely origami. Every one of those seams can either be bent or welded together out of a straight piece of material. Whether it's glass, or you'll see, you'll notice all of the, the, the glass in the car all flat, all right? All of these engineering surfaces are going to work very easily as far as from a design standpoint it's not going to take very long to get them from the design phase in the uh, uh in in the computer onto the the actual model and functionality because everything's straight you have a lot uh, a lot to work with then that also as he said opens up the ability to use cold rolled steel uh, stainless steel so that uh, uh, the the vehicle will be very very durable we're not talking any longer about a truck that you will discard after 20, 30 years, even if you're using it in serious, uh, uh, for serious industrial work. The, th the body's going to be indestructible. You'll just swap out, the, uh, uh, swap out the other parts. And so then that also gets them away from the stampings. Now, when they're trying to create a car for the very first time or a truck, those stamping dies... By the time you calculate in all of the engineering costs and, and, and everything, it's about a million dollars a die. And that's a million dollars for the hood, a million dollars for the hatch, a million dollars for each door, a million dollars for each quarter panel. So just to do a truck, you're into this whole thing for about 12 million bucks. And that's before you realize, ooh, the hood doesn't quite work. And so then you have to rework that and get everything to work. And so then finally you have the dies that are capable of producing the parts that you need. And then it's the time. Every stamping that they would have made for this truck would have meant that that was time that they couldn't stamp parts for the Model X, the Model S, the Model 3, the Model Y. And so from a runtime standpoint, also those stampings become very important. Okay, so what does that leave us with? It leaves us with a relatively ugly car that they've sent, they've, they've saved a fortune on because they didn't design it. They just engineered it, it was what it was, and now it's out the door. Well, so here's where we go back to our, uh, our, our monkey watching a magic trick. So GM had just gone through this whole thing with the Chevy Bolt and burned very badly uh, as far as that, that goes. Tesla wound up with 400,000 pre-orders. That's more than Chevy has sold to date in, in the Bolt. I think the Bolt sales are generally somewhere between uh, in that uh, kind of 25 to 30,000 unit uh, a year range. And then the Model 3, I think, is uh, right around, what, 140,000, 150,000. Uh, uh, you guys can uh, correct me in the comments if I've got that, uh, got that dramatically wrong. But... What they're missing is, they're missing why people are buying these vehicles. They're buying them because you have access to the supercharger network. They're buying them because the technology in the vehicles is completely sound. The range is outrageous. And they're gonna buy that truck for exactly those same reasons. And then some. Add into it the fact that it's ugly, but the payoff to that is, is that the thing is incredibly strong. And also, it's going to then be a truck. And you don't generally care about what happens to a truck. You're not going to have to worry about the door dings or 
anything of uh, anything of that nature. And because the exoskeleton is on the outside, is is all rigid uh, on the outside, it allows you to do things like mounting a fifth wheel. Uh, a hitch for a fifth wheel on the top of the Cybertruck and that will then allow you to drive the fifth wheel from either direction. That could be pretty interesting, I think. So there's all of these uh, all of these reasons that the existing auto manufacturers are missing that people are actually buying these vehicles. And the existing manufacturers are continuing to shoot themselves in the foot by thinking that they're going to design or style their way out of competing against this truck. They're not going to be able to style their way out of this. People are going to walk into that showroom and they're going to go, hmm, Ford F-150 has a 400 mile range, Ugly truck has a 550 mile range or whatever the top range is, is, is going to wind up being. And it is going to be that simple. Um, now, you know, as more trucks come on the market, maybe in, you know, 5, 10, 12 years, where they have 600, 700 mile ranges in a truck, sound batteries, we'll see what Rivian does. Then it may be a different landscape as comp as true competition starts to swell up uh, against something like the uh, something like the Cybertruck. But right now, mm, if I'm looking for a, a vehicle to run a job site off of, there isn't any. There isn't really any competition. I need a big battery. I need a, a, a truck that will be able to uh, support that. And now that we've discussed what the thing actually looked like, let's go ahead and give credit to the two guys that really nailed it. And the first here is James Bell, who sat down with his rum and ginger and figured out that, well, you know, the styling cues that uh, were talked about from the Blade Runner movie perhaps didn't mean the uh, rounded trucks that we've seen, but instead the faceted types of vehicles that we saw here with Deckard's vehicle and uh, uh, here's one of it in, uh, uh, in its cleaner trim so you can see it there. And again, the reason that they did that with these vehicles was for the exact same reason that they did it with the Cybertruck because it's easy. You want up then being able to produce a great number of these vehicles relatively inexpensive so that you can supply a bunch of cars for a movie. Well, he nailed it. That was uh, uh, fantastic, James. Well done there. And I know that I'm going to butcher this name here. K. Schillick, 9053. Um, they really nailed the aspect of the back that by a armored personnel carrier of the future, what Musk was talking about was that it was going to have that sloped back design that we see in the Humvee and other types of vehicles that have a utility back. And he even nailed the fact that there would be some kind of a retractable cover over it. So well done to, uh, uh, to, to both of you guys. So with, uh, with that, now let's go ahead and start to discuss some of the specifications on the vehicle. So we'll go ahead and we'll pull up now the vehicle specs that they showed uh, at, the, uh, at the event and also that they have put up on their uh, webpage. And now let's look at those specifications with regards to the kinds of things that I personally look at when I'm viewing something like this reveal or some other type of, of demonstration. When you're watching a magic trick, if you want to try and figure out how it's done, don't look where the magician directs you. Once you do that, you're just going to be amazed by the uh, by the, the skill of the magician. You're not really going to learn anything about the magic trick. In exactly that same way, when I watch these reveals and when they start giving out uh, uh, specifications, I'm not looking at the specifications that they're giving you. I'm looking at the specifications that are missing. Now, in that entire Cybertruck presentation, the one thing that was absolutely conspicuous in its absence was water. There wasn't so much as a drop of water anywhere in any of those instances that they showed the Cybertruck. Now, the reason I brought this up as being important is that they said that the truck would be able to ford water and it would be a, it would be so closed up that it would float now i'm having this feeling 
that that was one of those specifications that rolled off the tongue real easy, just like the Falcon doors, that actually wound up being very difficult to achieve from an engineering standpoint. Being able to seal up those motors, being able to seal up the battery. Now, it is something that is absolutely critical for a truck, especially when you start to consider that this thing will quite possibly be used as some kind of an emergency response vehicle. Electric vehicles are outstanding for that. I, I, I think that, that, that these will make an excellent disaster type uh, recovery vehicle, but they're going to have to be able to ford water. They're gonna to have to be able to hold a lot of water. And that brings us to another interesting point in that what would really sell the, something like the Cybertruck for me is if I could hose it out. If there was a version I could buy that had no carpet, that had a, uh, a front uh, uh, screen that was uh, uh, armored in, in such a way that, where, where it was uh, proofed against water incursion, go that extra mile on this thing. And then you'll see people start using them as, uh, uh, as expedition vehicles. And again, as, as that ultimate go hunting or you know go uh, go out and and grab a christmas tree or go to the beach and take the thing to to uh, uh uh surfing and diving and all of those things that you would really love to use that kind of a truck for and then when you get it home shh, hose it out that would be fantastic i think if they would go in uh, uh in that direction so that's one specification that i was looking at that was very conspicuous in its absence less important is the output of those plugs now if i'm going to buy one of these things to use it on a job site man how can you not tell people how much power it will be able to deliver? I think that that's one of the things that, that everybody's going to want to know. It's great that it has 110 and, and 220 plugs on it. That's fantastic. But what's really critical is how much power can those plugs put out? You know, what are we, you know, what are we looking at? You know, two kilowatts? Five kilowatts, ten kilowatts. What's my what's my output? What how much power can uh, uh, can I actually uh, uh, deliver to my job site? Very critical uh, uh, specification. And so the uh, last of these specifications, for you know, for for lack of a better word, is the uh, off-roading capabilities. Again, we didn't really. We didn't really see anything that was any kind of challenging. Now, it's a prototype. I'm not expecting them to go out and really, you know, smash their their, their prototypes around. But at some point, when they start getting into that pre-production phase, when they start getting things more sealed up, uh, that's something that we will have to expect to uh, be able to, to see from them. So now let's talk a little bit about the presentation itself as well as Patrick Frickle's uh, uh, hype prediction that, uh, uh, that, that he made. He's our, our, our honorable mention here. So the um, presentation was interesting. Uh, again, the uh, concern with all of these is the anticipation uh, for the event. And not only for the people attending the event, but also for... Elon himself. Now, here's a shot of uh, Elon standing there, and behind him is a truck with two shattered windows. <laughs> I I felt so bad for him. The I've I've had that exact same experience myself, where a piece of equipment that you've prepared that you're going to demonstrate, then you in the 11th hour just before you're you're going to demonstrate it you do your pre-demonstration checks you make sure that everything's going to uh, work function as as it needs to for the presentation and then something goes wrong and the machine eats itself alive and so then you have to go through and produce this presentation all the while you have a cosmetically damaged piece of equipment behind you it's just it's just terrible and so I felt very bad for him but these are the kinds of things that happen but it brings up Patrick Frickle's point and that was that uh, Tesla has to be careful 
about hyping this stuff up so much to the point that when people see something so shocking, not the windows, that's, you know, embarrassing, but you know, that's part of it, that's part of it, but the look of the truck, this was very different. This was very different. This was a half-designed truck. I'm just going to go out and say it. It's again, we're, I keep using that word designed. This, was, this truck was engineered. That's where the design work stopped. There was, there was no fashion over form here. This truck looks like it needs to in order to be able to be rolled out as inexpensive as they have. And again, so that brings, uh, I, I think, a poignancy to uh, Patrick's converse, Patrick's prediction there about the uh, uh, overhyping something. So we're going to close this out as I said we'd close it out with a conversation, a brief conversation about pricing and about what people really want to buy and the genius of doing what Tesla did with this Cybertruck. They've already got refined vehicles. They've also got the Model Y coming out. These are, and, and the, the, the new Roadster will be uh, coming out as well. So there's going to be plenty of eye candy and exhilarating acceleration and all of these other things that the potential customers will crave from a Tesla vehicle. But there's also going to be that damn truck. And that truck because of the way it's engineered, has so many features that are subtle in the way that they present themselves to what modern life will, is like and what will be like on into the future, that I think this is going to be a very attractive offering for Tesla. Not just the job guys, but if you want an and a nondescript vehicle that doesn't show what's inside it. That's, uh, again, that was a piece of genius having that solid metal cover come over. And not a, not a fiberglass cover, not a glass cover. If you want in there, you might be able to get in there, but it's gonna take some wana. It's gonna take some serious effort to try and get into the bed of that truck. And I think that that was exactly what they had in mind when they did it. And then the armored glass. Okay, so it broke on the demonstration, he threw a, 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 a shot put size ball bearing at that glass and it didn't go through. That was, <laughs> I, I, when I saw it, when I, when I saw that, that glass shatter, not like a piece of glass, uh, um, uh, a piece of safety glass on a modern car, it shattered like a piece of bulletproof glass. And so that really struck me as, oh man, the applications of that when you're trying to keep somebody out who doesn't have any business being in your vehicle man that's just that's fantastic and so the more i thought about the little things that they didn't even mention on, on there like the i measured the distance between the dashboard where when when you have the front doors open you can see where the steering wheel is and where the dashboard starts Take a look at the photo and take a look at the distance between the dashboard and the front of the car. It's three or four feet. I'm thinking most of that is going to be frunk. And if it is, can you imagine, again, a job type vehicle? All those tools held in basically a giant toolbox in the front of the car. And your job truck looks just like every other job truck. So people aren't gonna know which truck to break into. So again, there's these subtle things that, that kept kind of creeping in. The more, I, uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, wow, okay, well, you know, looks aside because <laughs> it is ugly. Uh, looks aside, trucks aren't necessarily the most beautiful things in the world anyway. They're designed to be functional and the existing automobile manufacturers have really gone out of their way to uh, make them as appealing as possible and over time we've just simply become used to that and we find beauty in their functionality. Well, I think we're just gonna be playing the same game with this and though we never may, we may never see this as any kind of a raving beauty as far as a, 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 a show truck type status. It is 
what it is. And I think that uh, uh, engineering-wise and um, the appeal to the general consumer, I think that Tesla really did wind up uh, knocking out of the park. So we'll go ahead and uh, close this video out here so it doesn't wind up too long. Again, thank you guys for your, your contributions and your comments in that previous video they were just absolutely fantastic i i read i read over read them many many times as you know as i was, I was looking through this and though uh, most of us didn't get it right as far as the overall layout i certainly you know would would have definitely died on the hill <laughs> that, that they would have put a centralized uh, uh seating position and, and all of that and but uh, there were uh, uh, good arguments all the way around for both that and for other styles and ultimately we got what we uh, we got what we got so thank you very much for joining us in this kind of a, a crazy blade runner themed uh, video i hope that wasn't too annoying for you guys and uh, we'll see you next time <laughs>